God. It's, 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 it's saying I can't. The, the reality, it's called the reality choice. It says this, I realize that I am not God. I admit that I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life has become unmanageable. You see, that's the first choice that all of us have had to make to move in a direction of health. Here's the second choice. Number one is I can't. Number two is this, God can. See, we, we believe and we put our hope in a power that is greater than ourselves and that power is God. God the Father through Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit. You see, that's good news because we have now a hope and a power that's greater than ourselves. That's the second choice. Putting our trust, earnestly believing in Jesus Christ. And last week we talked about this. If we say and admit that we can't, and we believe that God can, then the third step is this. We need to make a choice. We need to choose to commit our life and will to the care and comfort of Jesus Christ. That's the third choice. It's called the commitment choice. We, we need to let go and let God. That's what it's all about. And so we're going to be going into a choice today that is so important. It's very pivotal. It's called choice number four or the house cleaning choice. It, it's connected with the beatitude. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And, and, and the, the house cleaning choice is simply this. I openly examine and confess my faults to myself, to God, excuse me, to myself, to God, and to someone that I trust. I want to give you a little heads up here. This is the hardest part. Because it's, it's pretty easy to acknowledge that we're not God, that God is, and that we need to make a commitment. But number four, choice number four, the house cleaning choice, is when we take the next step and we involve other people. See, because what we so often do with our addictions, our hurts, our hang-ups, our habits, we so often do this. We want to be in control, so what do we do? We keep a secret. We hold on to it, and we don't let anyone know. That's our way of maintaining power over our pain, is we keep it a secret. But the Bible tells us that the secrets that we keep, those secrets, those unhealthy secrets, are what make us sick. And, and, and I, I want you to know, in, in, in each way, as we talk through everybody's story, this is a common thread. We've all had hurts that we've held on to. And it's those secrets that make us sick. Sixty-three years ago, I was eight years old. I was wearing a pair of green wool pants that my mom had made and a yellow knitted shirt, or sweater rather. <clears throat> and I was sexually abused by our neighbor, who was a lawyer. My dad was superintendent of schools in Lenox, so we were two high-profile families in a small town. Everybody knows you. At that time is when I learned to keep a secret. I knew I couldn't tell my mom and dad. I couldn't tell anybody. The second time it happened, same thing, just stuffed it. And I stuffed it. And I stuffed it for 30, 31 years. I was 37 years old when I remembered what had happened. I had made a trip back to Lenox to go to a funeral of another, another neighbor. And this man was there. And driving home, all of it came flooding back. But I still stuffed it. I still kept that secret. And it's, and it's what the enemy does, is he'll take our pains and our hurts, and he'll, he'll tell us, you can't share that. All of that went on a little eight-year-old girl to hold it all together because of what someone did. You see, our hurts, habits, and hang-ups, sometimes we do to ourselves, right? We agree. I mean, we're at, we're at the wheel, we're at charge. But so often it's something that was done to us that opens up a wound in us. And it's those secrets that keep us. And uh, it, it takes, and I'm going to read this this house cleaning choice because it's not just the things that we've done it's also the things that have been done to us and recognizing how those wreak havoc in our lives i, I want to read this again because it's so important i openly examine and confess my faults to myself to god and to someone i trust it, it takes others and this is where choice four is going to transform your life because you find someone first of all that you trust that's not easy to do and i'm not saying that you, you need to 
share it with everybody. What I'm saying is you need to find that person you can trust. Um, Judy, I want you to kind of follow up on that because you have, you have a story about someone that you could trust, don't you? Well, first of all, James 5, 16, therefore confess my sins to each other and pray to each other so that you may be healed. Confessing my faults to myself, to God, Gamblers Anonymous, and my best friend, Matt, my rock, was emotional, draining, and freeing all at the same time. Next month, I will have nine years clean of gambling. And it's not a journey you can take on your own, is it? It's not a journey we do on our own. Healing is a partnership. It's a journey. Ron, you, you've, had, you've had experience with this, too. Talk, tell us a little bit about your journey. When I was deep in my addiction, and... Uh, I thought I was the only one. I thought, how stupid could I be? I was overwhelmed with guilt and shame. And then I started to talk to people about it. I, I, in treatment, in Gamblers Anonymous, I found out I wasn't the only one. And that was, that was amazing, that I wasn't the only one that was doing stupid stuff. I also realized that I wasn't a bad person, that I was just making bad choices. And you know, man wasn't meant to, to walk through life alone. In Genesis 2.18, it states, it is not good for man to be alone. That's why God made Eve. But holding all their, your hurts, hang-ups, and habits inside you only keeps you sick. It's when you tell other people and get help that you can really heal. Um, I've told my story a number of times. And I remember one time after a meeting, a gentleman came up to me and said, thank you. Uh, I said, well, you're welcome, but it's just my story. It's just one of many. And he said, but yes, it offered me hope that I too can, can maybe beat this disease. Um, people have helped me when I first started in my journey. And I feel like I'm compelled to give back, to pay it forward, whatever you want to call it. Um, I really have a s very small biological family, but I think I have a large Gamblers Anonymous family. Uh, in the last year, I've become involved with Celebrate Recovery, um, a large family there, and my church family. So if I need to talk to somebody, I have a number of people that I can call 24-7 about anything. doesn't matter what's going on. could be just I had a bad day at work or whatever, but we're not meant to walk through life by ourselves. Uh, we need to talk about our problems, and that's the only way I feel that we can really overcome them. Amen, absolutely. That was, as we've talked, Jane, Jane came to me about three years ago. Is it okay if I kind of share this? Mm -hmm. She came to me about three years ago. She said, John, I need to talk to you. It was shortly after I had become the, um, stepped into the lead pastor role here. And she said, I need to share something with you. I was like, okay, great. Sat down and she unfolded her whole story to me in about 15 minutes. And I was, my eyes were kind of like this. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> but she, she, she did something in that moment. She said, and you, and never ask me to come up and sit in front of the church and tell everybody. <laughs> God has different plans. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think, Jane, I think you knew that. I think you knew that even when you said that because there was, there was this thought, this fear of what could happen. Because tell me, what was that thought? What was the, what was the thing in treatment that triggered you to go, oh my goodness, I think I, there's a way out of this. What was that one thought? Well, the one thought, is, as Ron just said, I realized I was not alone. I was not the only screw-up in this world because at the time you and I had isolated for years like I say my family had no idea my friends had no idea and then it just all came crashing down and so my first I guess journey to recovery was admitting to my son that I needed help I got into recovery and of course there daily many times daily you, 
are admitting to people that you are a compulsive gambler. But like I say, the biggest thing was realizing that I wasn't alone, and that was huge because I just totally was convinced that nobody else could be this stupid. <laughs> so then I got home, and I was attending many meetings. I had something going on as far as the recovery process every day of the week. I made sure I was busy. I made sure that I was going to aftercare. I made sure that I was getting myself to meetings. <clears throat> Well, one of the meetings that I attended was at Eastside Lutheran Church. And there was a gentleman there, and I, his name was Earl. And he kept talking about his church. And he would, I think, just about every week would talk about his church. And finally, because through all of this, even though I was healing, I still didn't have God where he needed to be. He needed to be front and center, and he still wasn't. So I went to Earl, and I said, what church are you talking about? Because it sounds fantastic. And he said, celebrate. And, of course, this was Celebrate Sycamore. So another gambler friend of mine decided that we would go. In the meantime, I did not know that my oldest daughter was searching for churches in Sioux Falls and had a, come across Celebrate. She has a friend who attends this church. She checked with him. She attended with me the first time. And when Pastor Keith got done speaking, she said, he's got it. This is where you need to be. And to this day, she will bring up, do you think you would have ever gambled if you had found Celebrate before you got into the gambling? Good question. Can't answer it. So then I... Like I say, then Brandon formed, and I felt the need because I was serving right off the bat. And when John became lead pastor, I thought, hmm, I wonder if they want an addict serving in this church. The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> we got a bunch of them already serving. Jay didn't know that. There's tons of addicts. Yeah, <laughs> wave your hand. I mean, there's all, they're all over the place. See, I'm not alone. Yeah. Not alone, and uh, this church is made up of a bunch of people that, that, have, that have made mistakes, and uh, the Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. So all one thing, John, I'm sorry, one thing I do want to bring up is the importance of life group. I had told John, but it was probably a year, year and a half, I can't remember, Lynn, when you started your first life group, and it took a few months, but I finally shared my story with my life group. And guess what? They didn't boo, they didn't hiss, they didn't kick me out. All they did was love me. And you, it's just, and so then due to changes, there was a second life group. Same thing, it was a few months. But I learned to trust and I learned to share. And same thing, nothing but hugs. And I want to thank all of you in this church. I've been told that I give pretty good hugs. In fact, Chad told me this morning it's the best hug he's had in a while. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys don't have a clue as to what it does to me. So thank you. Thank you for being my church family. Well, we're going to continue, uh, and I'm going to tell you, before they, before they step off, I want to tell you two things, because I don't, don't want to surprise you. I, I said this last week. This isn't about manipulation. This is about real stuff. And so there's two things I'm going to ask you uh, today. Uh, if, you, if you struggle with something, it, it doesn't have to be gambling. Um, it doesn't have to be alcohol or drugs, although it could be. If you struggle with one of those, we're going to invite you at the end of the service to just come forward. We're going to play a song at the end. We're going to come forward. They're going to be here. I'll be here. Um, there'll be others here to pray with you and just receive it. Maybe today God's leading you and saying, you know, I just need to confess it to somebody. We're not going to make, we're not going to ask you to stand up in the middle of church and walk up, but if you have something that you need to let go of, you need to confess, maybe for the first time, these folks are going to be up here, I'll be up here, we're going to just 
be open to receive that at the end of the service today. The second thing I want you to consider is the reason, the purpose for this message, the purpose for this series, and the purpose for this whole, the reason they're up here is because each of these people have, including, and there's one other that's not here, uh, she, she'll be here at the second service, uh, but have committed to a leadership commitment to begin a Celebrate Recovery right here in Brandon. And uh, we're going to be, we're taking the initial steps. We don't have a launch date, but we're just praying. They're meeting weekly. We're meeting monthly as a leadership team because I believe there are people in this community that have hurts, habits, and hang-ups that they haven't dealt with. And to have a Celebrate Recovery, a safe place where they can come and take that initial step, doesn't matter what church you're from, uh, we're going to host it here. But the reason we're doing this series is to get our church behind this idea that we can't do this alone. We need each other. We need help. And we need a pathway to, to, to faith in Christ. And Celebrate Recovery is that model. And so uh, each one of these people are leaders. If you have questions or if you have interest in being part of Celebrate Recovery, you can talk to any one of them. You can talk to myself um, about, that, about that ministry that's starting up. But um, would you just help me one more time thank these guys for all they've done. See, I, I believe this. I believe that when we start to get honest and serious about what God's doing in our lives, we have to step up. We have to admit reality. We have to do that. And so I, I'm so thankful for that, for those people and the heart that they have to share with you their story. It's not about them. I want you to know that it's not about them. It's about Jesus and what he can do. When you follow these principles that he's laid out in, in the Beatitudes, um, it, it's truly a path to healing. And this whole idea of honesty starts to come up and we get, we get afraid. We have a fear. And that fear is not common just to the folks that were up here and myself. It's common to all of us. We have a fear of rejection. You see, we want to be accepted. We want to be fully known and fully accepted. And when we start talking about the honest things that happen in our heart, we, we do this. We push back because we have a fear of being rejected. Well, I want to share something with you. It's in the Bible. John, the disciple John wrote this in his first letter in John, 1 John 4, 18. He says, perfect love casts out fear. I believe that whenever you're afraid, whenever I'm afraid, when we're afraid of admitting the truth, it's because we don't understand the Father's love for us. We don't understand how much God loves us. We don't, we don't have a picture of it. We, we think we do, but the reality is when we fear the truth, when we fear expressing the truth and being real, we don't have a full understanding of God's love for us. Jesus wants, he came this, he says, he says, those who come, I have, or Jesus says, I have come in order that you might have life and have it to its full. God wants us to have a, a, a full life. His desire is that we experience that. Jesus doesn't want us to be religious. He wants us to be real. You see, God isn't honored when we go through a ritual, okay? It's not about doing things, it's about being real. That, that's the step to healing. This fourth choice that we're talking about is this. The house clean choice, we've got to be real. We have to be real. And, and what I want to do in order to illustrate this is, if you have your Bibles, you can take them out. We're going to be in John chapter 11. It's a very famous story in the Bible where Jesus reveals himself to his disciples and to the people of Jerusalem. And, and he, gets, he, gets a, he gets a call. I don't know if it was a call. It was something like that. Maybe it was a text message from Mary and Martha. And they say, Jesus, your friend, Lazarus. Because Jesus is about relationships. Your friend Lazarus is sick and he's going to die. Please come now. And guess what Jesus does? He waits. He doesn't come. But in the end, he travels with his disciples to this town. He travels there. And in verse 43, we hear him say, Jesus says in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had, excuse me, and he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes. So, so imagine what's happening. There's this big cave. It's probably likely what it was. 
Lazarus comes out of the cave. He's bound hand and foot. He's tied, wrapped tight. Like, imagine kind of a mummy, okay? It's kind of a Halloween theme. Uh, I didn't choose it for that, but it's kind of a Halloween theme. I mean, he's like, come out, Lazarus. And what does Lazarus do? This dead guy who's been dead for four days, he's starting to stink. His family's a little, they're like, no, he, he smells. He hasn't had a bath in four days. His body's already starting to decay. Come out, Lazarus. I mean, this is a kind of a zombie picture. He's bound hand and foot. Listen to what Jesus says. His face was wrapped with cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. You see, Lazarus was bound with his grave cloths. And it's the same story for you and I. You see, when we believe in Jesus Christ, when we admit our need from him, when we put our faith in him and trust in him, realize something happens in us. We're brought from death to life. But that's not the end of the story. Jesus commands, he says to them, he says, loose him, let him go. What was binding him up? It was the grave clothes. You see, when you and I experience salvation, when we accept Jesus Christ and our Savior, we move from death to life. That's something only Jesus could do. But watch what Jesus does. He doesn't leave Lazarus all mummified and in a zombie state. What does he do? He says to them, you need to let him go. You need to loose him. It's why it's so important that those people, who is he talking to? It's his, his disciples, the family and friends of Lazarus. See, if you want to experience life to the full in Jesus Christ, you need to get around people who will help take off your grave clothes. Because when, we're, when we come to new life in Christ, everything is not sunshine and roses. Okay? We have things that we need to get off that need to be loosed of us. That's why we call it the house cleaning. That's why life groups are so important. That's why Celebrate Recovery is so important. It's people helping people to walk into freedom and new life in Christ. You cannot do it alone. I want you to turn to somebody and say you can't do it alone. It's impossible. You cannot do it alone. It takes other people. I I had someone, this was about a year ago, they came to our church. They came for three or four weeks. And this person was, uh, according to them, was well-versed in the Bible. And we had a moment, it was kind of one of those like showdown moments. I kind of envisioned like, like Clint Eastwood or something. Wah, wah, wah. And I had my Bible and he had his Bible. And, we're like... and, and it was kind of one of those moments. And he, he, he was, because after church he talked to me for like 20 minutes after every service. He talked, 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 talked. And he finally said to me, he goes, put, kind of did one of these things. He says, you know, I'm a Christian, but I don't need anybody else to be a Christian. I was like, what? <laughs> In the back of my mind is like, you have never read the Bible. And he said, I don't, I don't need the church. And I was kind of like, whoa. And so I, it didn't take long, but I, what I basically said to him in short, I said, well, um, it's probably not going to work out for you at our church. <laughs> because we're about relationships. The Bible is filled with all of these illustrations of how we need other people. I mean, Jesus came to set us free. Galatians 5.1 says, it's for freedom that Christ set us free. John 8, Jesus says, if the Son sets you free, you will be free Indeed, it's huge that you understand this. If you're in a mess, you need to confess, okay? If you're in a mess, you need to confess. It's the only way to get free. And I know this can be a scary thought, and I'm not denying that. I, I've walked the journey myself. I want you to know I'm, I'm with you in this addiction journey, okay? I, for 21 years, I was bound, okay? I came to know Christ as a 5-year-old, but as a 12-year-old, I discovered something called Skull Bandits, okay? And for 21 years, starting at the age of 12, I walked in addiction to nicotine. Now, some of you might laugh, some of you might joke, but I tell you, it wasn't so much about the nicotine as it was about the lying, the manipulating, and the cheating. Because I lived my life 21 days, I didn't want anybody to know. And I lied about it, I broke the law, I broke ministry covenants. I was a Christian, I'm in full-time ministry, and here I am going out and, and, and just using this product, okay? And, and there's, nothing, there's no passage in the Bible that says, thou shalt not dip snuff. But for me, it wasn't about that. Because for me, it was about the fact that when I got broken or when I got scared or tired or hungry or whatever, instead of going to my father in prayer, guess where I went? To my back pocket. Okay? I did it for 21 years. I got very good at it. And this Wednesday, I got a text from my friend. This is huge. And he said, congratulations, 2,500 days clean and sober, nicotine free. He and I quit two days apart from each other. (laughs) 
I, like Judy and Ron, tried to stop several times, and I did, even once for a whole year and a half. I stopped, but I had never let anybody know. I had never formed a bond with a brotherhood that said, I'm going to help you. I'm there with you. Michael texted me. I haven't seen the guy in three and a half years. He lives in Kansas City, Missouri, and he texted me on Wednesday morning. He said, congratulations. And see, what happened was I believed in God, okay? I had given my life to him, but I still needed other people to break the chains, to break the cloths that had wrapped me up for years. And now, I can tell you, living free and light, I don't have to worry about getting found out. I don't have to live in that fear. That anxiety no longer is a part of me because I don't have any secrets. I don't have any secrets. See, that's the power of living in Christ. That's what Christ wants for your life. And we can trust God in this because he wants to have a pure heart. He's given us a pure heart. In fact, he's transforming our heart The Bible says in Ezekiel, from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. It's what he's doing. 1 John 1, 9 says this, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. He will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I I want you to know this, and this is is one of the fill-ins. The basis for a pure heart, the basis for a pure heart, is not in how good you've been. It's in how good God is. You see, here's the hope for a pure heart. You and I, we don't have a pure heart. But guess who does? God does. And he wants to give it to you. He wants to transform your stony heart into a heart of flesh. He wants that. Judy Judy mentioned this, and it's so true. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Find a trusted person. You, You mentioned Matt. I had a Matt in my life. He was huge. He's still in my life. We talk, uh, well, we he used to live here, so we talked weekly, but now he, he moved to Colorado. But he and I talk on a regular basis, and we always check in with each other because he was the first person to ever speak truth to me. He told me, he said, John, you're an addict. It's out of control. Your life is unmanageable. He spoke that to me. What a great friend to speak the truth to me when I couldn't see it. That's when that healing journey began. And here, here's some things I want you to remember, some fill-ins, some last ones here. Remember this. When you go to God, remember God's kindness. God has kindness for you. Romans 2, 4 says God's kindness leads you towards repentance. Here's the second thing we need to remember. Remember God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness. Philippians 1 says, I'm convinced that God who began this good work in you will carry it through to completion on the day of Christ. Remember God's faithfulness. And the third thing is this. Jesus, God is kind to us through Jesus Christ. He's faithful to us through his, uh, through his word. And then the third thing is this. Remember God's promises. Remember his promises. Psalm 51, it's one of my favorite passages. It's the passage, it's the song that David wrote after he had been caught and confessed his adultery with Bathsheba. Psalm 51 is an incredible passage because he had been denying it. He had been pushing back. He, he, he not only committed adultery, he had, the, had Bathsheba's husband murdered. He He did. But listen to what he says at the end, and you can read Psalm 51. If you're in that place, I would encourage you to go to Psalm 51. It says this, The sacrifice you desire, God, is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart. See, that's the promise of God's word. It's not my promise. It's his promise. God cannot reject you. It's not in his nature. If you come to him with brokenness, repenting, wanting to turn, he cannot reject you. I'm going to invite the team to come forward because I want this service and I want this day to be an encouragement to you. I want you, and when I say encouragement, I don't just mean a pat on the back. I want you to take courage in understanding whatever you're going through, whatever your hurts have been, whatever habits you might have, whatever hang-ups are a part of your life, which guess what? I know you have them, okay? I know you all do. I know we all do. I want to take and encourage you, give you courage to step up and begin the house cleaning choice. Maybe you've already committed your life to Christ. Maybe you've already put your faith in him. Maybe you're down that road. But maybe, like me, you've never said, I need help. I need someone that I can lay this on, I can share this with. It doesn't happen in a moment. It's a process. But God has in it for you a pure heart. He has in it for you a blessing. And it's healing. And we just need to follow his plan. Because Jesus came, he came for freedom. It's for freedom that he's set us free. We're not supposed to walk around like Lazarus with our grave clothes on. We're just not supposed to do it. We're supposed to live confidently, fully, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, 
by his power in the person of Jesus Christ. It's who we are. And so I want to invite you. I'm going to ask you to, I'm going to, ask you to pray together. As the team's playing, they're going to lead us in another song. I just want you to close your eyes if you would. Without anybody looking around, if you're comfortable with that, I want us to turn our hearts to the Lord and remember that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. But it took his friends to set him free. I want you to ask God a question. Actually, I want to ask, I want you to ask him two questions. What is it that I need to be set free from? And who do I need to talk to about taking this step of freedom? Ask God those questions right now in your own heart. What is it that's still binding me? What is it that I still wear around of my old life? And who is it, God, that you're leading me to that I can share this with? Because I can't do it alone. I can't take it off myself. I've got a tail out, I've got a tail light out in the vehicle of my life, and I need someone to trust that can share that with me. Maybe you're here today and you say, I don't know where to begin. I don't know that I have a friend like that. I want you to know this, that you have a friend in Jesus. You have a friend in his church. And I want to invite you to receive by the Holy Spirit the power, the courage that it takes. Simply say these words. I need help. Trusted to you. Father, I pray for each person in this room is that as we close today, that you would lead them. There's something that they need to lay down here this morning before they leave this building. God, I pray that you give them the courage that after the song, they would just come forward and receive your grace, your forgiveness, your mercy. Father, we pray it now in Jesus' precious name. Amen.